everybody, and welcome to part nine of our Magdalene series, where we are reading through the book, Mary Magdalene Revealed, The First Apostle, Her Feminine Gospel, and The Christianity We Haven't Tried Yet by Megan Watterson. This, unfortunately, is the last installment of this book. We will be finishing this book up today. But next week, we will be starting with the Magdalene Manuscript. I will put a link to the Magdalene Manuscript down in the description box below in case you would like to purchase the book to follow along with us. As I've said before, it's not necessary to pur purchase these books because I am reading directly from the book. I know that for many people, money is tight right now and I can absolutely respect that. So please don't feel like it's absolutely necessary for you to have the physical copy of the book in order to participate in this series. Today, we're gonna to be starting with a chapter called The Woman with the Alabaster Jar. To be anointed with oil is higher than being immersed in water. It is when we are anointed, not when we are immersed in water, that we become Christians. Christ was called the Messiah because of this. He is the anointed one, the gospel of Philip. What she has done will also be told in her memory. I was back from the pilgrimage and watching the first season of The Crown on Netflix. Binge watching, that is. I had spent most of the day for the time I had to write while my son was at school on compiling notes about Mary Magdalene and her connection to anointing. The episode I happened to watch was the one about the controversial television coronation of Queen Elizabeth in 1953. The TV monitors are all switched off in the moment when the Archbishop approaches the Queen with the holy oil. This is the most sacred part of the ritual. We are told by the Duke of Windsor's, the would-be king who abdicated the throne for his love of Wallace Simpson, an American socialite and divorcee. He narrates to an audience of guests in his mansion in France as they take in all the complexities of the coronation. When someone asks why the anointing is the holiest part of the ceremony, too holy even to be televised, the former king explains that the anointing is the moment when the divine is infused into Elizabeth's human form. It's when she is no longer just Elizabeth, but Queen Elizabeth II. The holy oil marks that transformation from only human to now also divine. And from a truther's perspective, we know that the um, powers that be, including the monarchy, actually do think they're divine and do think they're actually better than us. But y'all know where I'm going with that. The archbishop hesitates before making the sign of the cross with the oil on her chest and then her forehead. This is the part of the coronation that converts her from a woman into a queen. The first time I came across the biblical passage about Mary Magdalene anointing Christ was in John Yves' translation of her gospel. This is the translation with the painting by Giotto di Bondé of Mary Magdalene lifted up by angels above the mountain, which I can now say I climbed. This is the scene and the legend that inspired my need to find her cave, an external depiction that for me is symbolic of what happened within her, the cave being her own heart. Christ says in Matthew 26, 13, by pouring this perfume on me, she has prepared my body for burial. John Eves explains that Mary Magdalene walked the path of the sacred marriage. She demonstrates with her actions that she has become a bridge between the worlds. This act of anointing Christ's body couldn't have happened with just anyone. The fact that Mary was the one to have anointed Christ is a fact that marks her profound significance. What she has done will also be told in memory of her. And this is super important. And I think this is going to come out again in the Magdalene manuscript in the next book we're reading. Because if you think about being anointed, when you're anointed by someone in religious ceremonies or for spiritual purposes, you're typically anointed by someone that you view as being um, spiritually superior to you. And so the fact that Yahshua Jesus Christ asked Mary to anoint him shows great significance to what he thought of her. She was the other Christ. And as we'll see in the Magdalene manuscript, she was actually the one to activate him. And we again see evidence that this is true because Jesus had her anoint him. The day we found the cave after a teary goodbye with Aliup, the Frenchman and their beautiful teenage kids, I called Veronica for a ride back from the cafe at the base of the mountain. Her husband answered and came to get me. 
As we made our way down the winding road that leads back into town, he told me that supposedly on the day Mary Magdalene died, she came down from the cave in the mountains to the town of St. Maxim. He said she had given St. Maxim a vision of her descent. So St. Maxim was waiting there for Mary at the entrance to the town. As soon as she arrived, St. Maxim rushed to her and she fell into his arms. There was a monument to mark where she died. It's just there on the side of the road. He stopped the car so I could get out and look at it. It's a large stone pillar with Mary Magdalene at the top of it being lifted up by four angels. I pressed my hand to it and closed my eyes. I thanked him and asked to go to her cathedral, St. Maxim. The icon I found of her then in the gift shop is the one of Mary Magdalene holding an alabaster jar. The alabaster jar Mary holds in so many of the paintings and icons of her filled with holy oil used to anoint the body before burial. This John Yves believes reveals that Mary Magdalene understood how to master the transition of death. Her appearances with special oils to use in anointing Jesus Christ placed her in the tradition of priests and priestesses of Isis, whose unguents were used to achieve the transition over the threshold of death while retaining consciousness. So yes, again, Mary Magdalene, as well as Yahshua, Jesus were raised in the priest and priestesshood of Isis and Osiris not in the Jewish tradition. When Judah is horrified that she wastes such an excessive amount of oil that could have been sold and money given to the poor, Christ says it was intended that she should save this oil for the day of my burial. It was intended. This was not an act Mary did on a whim. She didn't just suddenly spill a year's worth of wages into oil onto Christ's feet for the hell of it. This was intentional. This is what had been intended all along. Anointing is still the most sacred aspect of ritual in Christian tradition, but we have forgotten the memory of the women who made it sacred. In the Gospel of Philip, it explains the power of the holy oil to convert a human into the divine. The name Christian is welcomed with anointing. In this fullness and energy of the cross, which the apostles call the union of opposites, then one is not just Christian, one is Christ. What's the union of opposites? Think of every binary that comes to mind, male and female, light and dark, human and divine, life and death. The union of opposite comes when you've reached a state of consciousness that allows you to integrate them both. The ego seeks to divide and separate, which is important, crucial even, if you want to arrive at work on time and fully dressed or write checks with your accurate name signed on them. The ego rocks in that department. And if you want to distinguish yourself as the one to blame or the one who is entirely blameless in the breakdown of a relationship, the ego reigns. Only the ego can identify the opposites. Only the soul knows the union of both of them. To be an anointed Christian in this context means to live with the consciousness of this union. And if we see the resurrection narrative as a metaphor, The anointing ritual becomes the passage from the death of the ego, the limited self, the egoic operating system, into the expansive realm of the soul. This is the transformation of consciousness at the heart of the Christian tradition. And Mary Magdalene is the one who showed us the way. Anointing then in its original context was the act of consciously acknowledging that the physical body passes away, but the soul within the body does not. To reclaim anointing in its original context would make it that the sacramental centerpiece of a whole new vision of Christianity based on spiritual transformations and the alchemy of love. After Mary anoints Christ with a spikenard and washes his feet with her hair before his crucifixion, Christ says in Matthew 26, 6 through 13, truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached in all the world, what she has done will also be told in the memory of her. The next chapter is the language of angels. If the Savior considered her to be worthy, who are we to disregard her? For he knew her completely and loved her steadfastly. The Gospel of Mary, chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Like the mystic Marguerite Portier, we have so much of what Joan of Arc actually said. Her real words. Because of a lengthy trial leading up to her death. It's because of these transcripts from the trial we know details about her life before she became a legend. For example, that Joan would have preferred to stay home spinning wool. 
She never intended to be anything more than what was expected of a peasant girl in rural France in the early 15th century when she was born. I often imagine that moment when Joan of Arc cut her hair. She was 13. And because of a vision she had of an archangel Michael, she cut her hair short, dressed in men's armor, and led the army in several campaigns that shifted the Hundred Years' War in France's favor. I die for speaking the language of angels, Joan said. She had succeeded in every battle she was a part of. She wasn't on trial because of treason or war crimes charged against her. She wasn't even ultimately on trial for the reason they gave her, repeat offenses of cross-dressing. She was on trial because she had listened to a voice inside of her, a voice that transcended the sex and gender roles of rural France in 1430. She spoke the language of angels, which has no ceiling and no limit to the possibilities of what we can be in this lifetime. This is why she was burned at the stake. Not because she dressed like a man, which she did, but because she listened to the voice of love inside of her and she believed it enough to let it guide her. The church declared Joan of Arc guilty of cross-dressing in 1431 and burned her at the stake. Supposedly, her last words were, hold the cross so high that I may see it through the flames. 25 years later, her mother demanded a retrial. Joan of Arc was declared innocent in 1456, and Pope Benedict canonized her as a saint in 1920. I don't know what language of the angels sounded like exactly for Joan, but if I had to guess, I'd say it's about hearing what's already in the heart and then declaring, even if you're terrified, I am not afraid. I was born to do this, like St. Joan did. Joan of Arc is the girl who had the courage and the still-like faith to follow the voice of an angel only she could hear from within her. The voice cut her free from any expectations projected onto her in a world that she was born into. That voice connected her to her own inner world. She was burned at the stake for speaking the language of the angels, which meant following that voice within her that no one else could control or contain. That voice that only she could validate and act on. Act and God acts, she said. This is where worth comes in. What can block that voice, the language of the heart, the vision of love that's within us is an ancient misunderstanding that we're not worthy of such proximity to an angel. It's that ancient divide, the idea that there is humanity and then there is divinity, that the two are separate. And what's more, one is higher, more crucial, or more holy than the other. The powers of the ego, the seven powers that we have moved through in Mary's gospel, are about a power over. But the language, this vision, is about a power with. It's about a love that comes from understanding the worth inherent in being human. A love that comes from experiencing every nature, every modeled form, every creature existing in and with each other. Act and God acts. This is the living exchange, a constant dialogue, a mercy. Who are we to disregard that voice of love? Levi in Mary 10.10 10 reminds Peter that Christ considered her worthy. For he knew her completely and loved her steadfastly. So how could Peter disregard her? And how could we? Now let's imagine for a moment that nothing in any gospel has ever been literal. Let's imagine that it's meant to be poetic and suggestive that all scripture is meant to point us through the parable after parable to an awakening that can only come from within. Then the cross can represent the intersection, the meeting point of all opposites, the place that's out beyond life and death, male and female, light and dark, human and divine, heaven and hell. The cross can be the holy instance when we can finally see who we truly are, hold the cross high so that I may see through the flames. We are not this struggle, this heartbreak. We are not this triumph, this drive to win. We are not the impulse to cause pain or the compulsion to save lives. We are the moment when we think we are forsaken, forgotten. The moment when we think we are alone. And from out of the darkness, a voice calls our name and we remember. Love is stronger than death. 
and disregarding Mary and forgetting who she was to Christ. For he knew her completely and loved her steadfastly. We disregard the aspect within us that's fluent with the angels. We forget that actually Christ did not die alone on the cross. There was one who never left, who was with him from within her heart. There was a woman who could perceive his soul. Remember, she wept at seeing the tomb empty. She needed to be with his body. She was there when no one else was. She was the love that remained. She wept. And also there at the tomb, she spoke to two angels. In place of where Christ's body had been, Mary saw, like Joan, two angels cloaked in white. Remember, they appeared within her. They asked her, why are you weeping? Then Mary turns, and Christ asks her the same question as the angels. Why are you weeping? Because love is stronger than death. This is what has been hidden from us. A love that is a power we have always been worthy of. A love that is a power with us, from within us. A love that brings us back to life again and again. The next chapter is the prayer of the heart. What is your inside is your outside. And what you see on the outside, you see revealed on the inside. The Thunder Perfect Mind. Chapter 4, verses 30 through 31. I was in full-on mom mode. It's a mode that feels like a possession. Like I've morphed into a cyclone, cleaning up as if I've had seven arms and calling out directives as at my son, as if we were suddenly under some sort of deadline to get everything organized in his room, as if we were about to get judged by some galactic panel that comes down hard on the messy and disheveled. And then suddenly shy belted from across the room with as much angst as a foreigner themselves, that classic 80s chorus of wanting to know what love is. This, of course, cracked me up. He was communicating with such levity and with the little twinkle in his eye that he was feeling ordered around right now, not love. So I replied by singing the next line to the chorus with matching angst and strain, begging to know what love is and wanting someone to show me. He is skillful means at such a young age. With one lyric, he snaps me out of the trance of who I don't have to be. I tackled him onto the bed and started kissing his cheek like some crazy puppy until those pearls of laughter I loved so much came from him, dismantling the energy in the room, the same way rays of light breaking through the thick cloud cover shift the landscape. I returned to myself again, not a mom primarily, not a form-fitting knowable thing, not a revered or hallowed thing, just a human woman who loves with all her being this miraculous human who came from her own body. Later that day, when Shai was with his dad, I went to a yoga class at the studio I love called Inner Bliss. I love yoga. I do very little of it. I am apt to child's pose. I spend half the class in it. And I often enter Shavasana, the corpse pose, about half an hour before everyone else does. I've never felt the need to actually go into whatever pose the teacher leads us through. Everything feels like a suggestion. It feels like church for my body, body church. It's a place to be present in my body with a whole bunch of other bodies, a place to listen and to rest my head on my stinky yoga mat and just let all my thoughts go and do whatever helps me hear the voice that's always here with me, within me, ceaselessly telling me the love I know. Don't listen to what she just said. That is an absolute no-no when it comes to the practice of yoga. Number one, child's position isn't actually a pose in yoga and it's not called Shavasana. It's called Sukhasana. And no, you don't get to just do what you want because if you do what you want, you're avoiding your own work. And in traditional yoga, you have to go through the difficult postures because it triggers openings in your body that allow you to explore different emotions. So please disregard everything she just wrote there. That is not that's disinformation when it comes on yoga. And 90, unfortunately, 99% of the yoga you see in the United States and in the West is not yoga. It's a bastardization of the beauty of true yoga. So please ignore everything she just wrote there. I stay seated even after all the other budding yogis pushed back into their first of a billion downward dogs. I stay rooted. Again, please ignore what she's saying. Um, and they're not yogis. A yogi is someone who has found enlightenment. No one's a yogi until they found enlightenment. And if you found enlightenment, if you are a yogi, they're not practicing yoga anymore. So that in itself is not correct. Um, I stay rooted, sitting cross-legged on my mat, pretending my spine extended down deep into the earth, reaching all the way to the underside of Australia. And that ray of light shot up through the crown of my head, blinding the angels a billion of light years away. Again, that is um, 
escapism. That's not yoga. Yoga is not about escaping. It's about actually being present with your problems and your thoughts and your emotions. I try to see my body as the world tree. And of course, both places all the way down and all the way up are right here inside the heart. I took a deep breath and I felt that descent inward. And then I took a second breath to feel connected. And once I did, I whispered, where am I divided? Instead of an answer, I felt compelled to open my eyes and start to move. So I met the class where they were plank position. I planked and asked again, as I noticed the tension mounting in my neck, where am I divided? I just, I'm going to keep reading this chapter, but um, everything she's saying here, if she were my student, I would have to start her all the way over at the beginning again, because none of this is actually traditional with the practice of yoga. There was a super duper handsome yogi man on my left. He was so attracted. It sounded as if, as if a slight gong noise emitted from his chest. We were asked to do the cat cow pose next. Wrong. That's not an actual pose. And you need to be speaking in Sanskrit, calling these names in Sanskrit. It's disrespectful to call them in English translation because that's not their name. I went into the X-rated version, cranking my neck up far enough that my mouth opened ever so slightly and tilted my pelvis to an unnatural degree. On my third time through, I felt a sharp tweak of pain. I'd overcocked my coccyx. I yelped. The pain was like a slap. Wake up. I was aware then that I was cat cowing the hell out of my body for the sake of a handsome yogi man beside me who, of course, hadn't even noticed. I started to laugh. And the thing, too, like noticing attractive students in the room if you're super focused on your practice and you're following your tristy you won't notice the other students in the room how human of me a wide cheshire cat smile took over my face i whispered again now with levity and pulsating joy where am i divided the song ended in a new song began right there a voice i adore krishna das krishna das is a kirtan player and you're actually not supposed to be listening to music when you practice yoga um no music Music entices the senses. And at the end of the second pada of the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali tells us specifically that we are learning to control our senses, to observe our senses. And music can also entice, uh, again, an escapism for the mind instead of forcing the mind to actually focus on the work at hand. So please don't listen to music when you're practicing yoga. That's a, that's a big no-no. A voice that goes back to when I first fell in love with yoga at divinity school while studying the divine feminine uh, tantra Isis and finding Mary's gospel all while beginning to understand that no matter how many sacred texts I read, I will never learn more than when I'm able to just be fully present in my body. It was a chant by Krishna Das I hadn't heard before. And as we move slowly into warrior one pose, it's not warrior one pose. It's Varavadrasana A, Sanskrit, Sanskrit. The three elements of Ayurveda are um, breath, food, and vibration. So vibration is super important. Our words are super important. And so therefore, these yoga postures in the prescription of practicing need to be called by their proper names, the Sanskrit. And so warrior one is not, warrior one doesn't exist. It's Varavadrasana A. Anyway, as we move slowly into Varavadrasana A, I heard Krishna dosing the chorus Shai and I had just belted out to me earlier that day from Foreigner about wanting to know what love is. My smile got even wider. I know this state so well, the state of grace where everything is so loud and clear and so entirely in my face, where the messages of what's here to learn, to take in, present itself in these curious sympathies like synchronicities as Carl Jung would call them. I sang quietly along with Krishna Das as he continued chanting his kirtan to God about wanting to feel what love is and knowing you, God can show me. I had prayed myself right into the experience of the answer. When things align like this, I remember what union might mean. As if in a dream I had recently, I can't articulate the details with any precision. It's more of a fleeting feeling that seems to slip in and out of my grasp like a spirited fish with slippery skin. It's this feeling of integrity where what's within me is outside of me, where who I am, all that I am is right here present. And what I think and feel comes through me effortlessly with no filtering and no holding back, where the love within me expands out in widening circles, where I'm aware that I hold love within me and that I am held in love from outside of me, where I'm in love. And this lets me feel, even if it's just momentarily, the bliss of continuing, of being undivided from my heart to my words and thoughts, to how my body moves and breathes, to all the unified and undivided. I'm unified. I'm undivided. This is how I understand the passage from the thunder perfect mind. What is your inside is your outside. 
And what you see on the outside, you reveal on the inside. The alchemist dictum, as above, so below, points to this same truth. If the world within us is bound to ego, we will see a world outside of us through that lens. And if the world within us is free to see with the eyes of the soul, then we see things as they truly are. We will see the heaven that's already here. Nowhere else but in the humble, frequently humiliated, utterly shattered human heart. This is the singleness I believe Christ reached and Mary followed. And this to me is what made her the first apostle, or if you prefer, the apostle to the apostles. This capacity to become undivided. Apostleship does not lie in having been near Jesus, taught or studied with him, or attended the Last Supper. It lies in the inner integration, singleness, which allows that person to live in continuous communion with the master in the imaginal meeting ground through the power of the pure heart so that thy kingdom come is in fact a living reality. This to me is the perfect human, the anthropes that Christ and Mary's gospel calls us all to be. We are to clothe ourselves with this holy mix of being an ego, a self that struggles every single day to cope, and also equally a soul that is eternal and knows it, a soul that is love and never needs to prove it. And this is the state I can keep choosing to be in, and I can practice returning to faster. Yes, I'm here in the state with the slogan, the heart of it all, my home state that has asked me to heal all the way back and all the way through. Ultimately, I'm here in my body, in this cathedral heart that's all lit up with love that has never left. I have died to the ego's idea of me, which is something I keep doing daily. I have replaced an eye for an eye, a hand for a hand, so that what I see blazes. This is why everything has changed and everything has stayed the same. Because what has always been here in my heart is now met fully. What I knew might exist does. My inside is my outside. This is what the gospel of Mary gave to me. The confirmation of what my body has always told me. There's another way to see what it means to be human and God all at once. Like a yolk in an egg, like a soul in a body, like a world within a world that begins and never ends. So this brings us to the final chapter of the book. This is the afterword. And it's titled, I Believe Mary. We should clothe ourselves with the perfect human, acquire it for ourselves, as he commanded us, and announce the good news. The Gospel of Mary, chapter 10, verses 11 through 13. Now that we've heard about what has been hidden from us, the last passage from the Gospel of Mary answers what we can each do to acquire the perfect human for ourselves. Personally, the word perfect makes me cringe. I much prefer the word complete or true in its place. True as in whole, authentic, integral. So we are to clothe ourselves with the true human. And this means that once we have stripped ourselves of the stories and ideas that feed the raging fires of the ego or the power to judge, which ensnares us in the cycle of the ego's seven powers, then the only thing we should put back on this is the understanding or vision of being a true human being, the self and the soul united. This, of course, does not mean we remain that way. Perfect, whole, unified, complete. It does not mean that we are infallible and incorruptible, and that we float around from now on several feet above the ground. It doesn't mean that we have to always wear white, never have sex, and abstain from anything that would actually make us happy. All of these ideas of perfect have confused us about what it means to be spiritually, to be a spiritually grown up and true human being. As humans, we forget, as Mary revealed to us, the chains of forgetfulness bind us to the ego. The work we're being called to here, though, is to clothe ourselves with the perfect human. So we have to do the work that allows us to remember again and again, and with greater ease and levity, this experience of the self as also a soul. This experience of not just being this pain, this grief and terror of the ego, but also this soul of love that loves through us. This love that whispers from within us when we are exhausted and alone. Give to me what you cannot carry. We are to acquire it for ourselves as he commanded us. 
which translates to me as seeing Christ as an example, a way shower, a trailblazer in what it means to be human. This doesn't speak of idolizing or worshiping or distancing Christ from us or from what it means to be human. This says he commanded us to try as we are each able to experience the truth that he realized, which is that within the human heart sits as a treasure. That treasure will be referred to as a diamond, as a light that pierces all the other lights, as heaven, as gold by the alchemist, as the soul, as the aspect of us that's inseparable from God. If we can acquire it, since it's already ours, and since it's already here within us, then we will be able to see, thanks to the know, the eyes of the heart, that we are not separate from it, that we are no greater or less than a mustard seed, a tree, a flower, a wolf, a star, an angel, those streaks of red in the sunset that take our breath away. We are aware again of what we have forgotten, that everything exists in and with each other. And this is humbling and empowering all at once. Because when I speak, If I speak from this place, from this treasure that has been hidden from us, then I use a voice that is more than my own. I become a voice in service of love. I become that one unified voice that demanded Thecla's freedom. It's a voice that's more like fire, like an invisible flame that's inconspicuously meets us in the silence inside us and asks us to be brave enough to tell the truth. This is how, for me at least, I can announce the good news as a voice of the service of love. The good news is that God is simply good and that God is not male or female or removed from us high above or beyond our comprehension. God is simply the good which exists within and between each one of us. The good news is that there is no such thing as sin We have nothing to be ashamed of in being human, in having a body, in feeling all that this body knows, which is lost to the intellect and beyond reason. We have nothing to be ashamed of or to ever have to hide when it comes to who we love. Who we love is not determined by our body or theirs, not their sex or their gender, but the soul that expresses itself through it all. And the authority for speaking on behalf of this love comes from the depth of transformation a person has undergone within themselves to remember who they really are. It is determined by their proximity to this experience of love, to this treasure Christ commands us to find. And that proximity to love lets them emanate humility because they know in their bones the radical worth and equality of us all. It lets them radiate mercy an almost freakish amount of giving all their love away, giving their love to anyone and everyone, knowing as they do that the more they give, the more they receive from within the heart. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Mercy is this exchange, this law of the universe. Announcing is not converting. Heart speaks to the heart directly. Those who have two ears will be able to hear and understand It's our work to do what we can to remember the soul, to remember the love that's the heart of how and why we heal. It's our work to undo the systems of power that confuse us into forgetting our own power. The good news to me is that true power rests within us, that like Mary Magdalene, like Thecla, Perpetua, Joan of Arc, Marguerite Portier, and Teresa of Avila demonstrated No one outside of us can keep us from finding this power because it's not a power over us or outside of us. It's a power that rests within us and we can rest in it, be led by it and be carried by it. It's a power that takes us breath by breath if we let it to the places where our ego is the loudest and most afraid so we can become aware of the contrast, the stark contrast between the world the ego sees and the world love sees. It's a power that's the opposite of power. It's love. And it's this love that frees us from the ego so we can hear what's in the heart and then tell the truth. And that might sound too daunting, telling the truth. Let me call on Hemingway here. When I get overwhelmed with what I'm going to write or how in the hell I could ever say what feels like a symphony inside of me, I freeze up and cry 
and spend most of the day cleaning the floor or the toilet so I don't have to face my own inaptitude. Same, same, same. I do that too. Same. <laughs> to start writing again, I turn to Hemingway's reminder. All you have to do is write one true sentence. Write the truest sentence that you know. We just have to tell each next truth we hear from within. And this is what frees us from the very unique cages of our own ego we have constructed for us. The perfect or true human is anchored into this love and also is equally still and for as long as we have a body, this raging ego that will resist the death that love demands. So it's all part of the process. It's part of what it means to be spiritual and to be perfect and to be an absolute mess at times. To fall flat on our egos and scream, for example, while sobbing in the shower, or to storm out of a situation you can't possibly handle calmly in the moment. The good news is that it's just alpha and then omega ad infinium. It's just a constant return, a myriad of opportunities to come back to that voice of love inside of us. And we can spend less and less time away from it or feeling as though we're separate from it or aren't worthy of it if we choose to. Being human isn't a failure. Being human is the soul's chance to be here. The guru, the saint, the magi, the perfected ideal of yourself that can radiate beams of light like Princess Fiona after Shrek's true love kiss and remain that way is an illusion. This is often used as a way for us to feel inadequate, to constantly compare ourselves, to constantly suggest to ourselves that we're not there yet. We haven't arrived. The good news is we never arrive. None of us. Not even the holiest person you can think of in this moment. We never get there. That's the whole point of being human. The point is to constantly arrive. For some of us, with each breath, we constantly return to love. This is the good news that we can, that it's set up this way, that no matter who we are or how long we've been separated from feeling the presence of love, it's actually right there within. I came across an article recently published in Harvard Magazine about Dr. Karen King and her translation of Mary's Gospel titled The Bits the Bible Left Out. Dr. King says it occurred to her that the central point of the gospel wasn't the dispute between disciples, but the rise of the soul. King explains, the more I thought about it, the more the gospel seemed to be about a spiritual path in this life, as much as what might happen in the afterlife. An ascent narrative, a story about the rise of the soul. This is the heart of the gospel of Mary. For me, what I've come to understand is that it's the soul's rise, not me, not my ego, not anything human that I am. The soul rises up from within me. It's the soul that rises, and I descend inward to meet it. Does that make sense? The soul rises up from within the heart, and we have that chance again and again if we can get, if we can get still and present enough to just listen. And we don't have to wait until death to encounter the soul. The soul is right here, like our own private heaven inside us. We can choose to die now and live as someone who has walked through death like Mary and choose to resurrect as someone who cannot be separate from love. Your inside will be your outside. If you can listen to the silence inside you, hear what love wants you to say, to do, then no one outside of you can ever silence you again. And for me, each time I do this, no matter how small or ins insignificant the truth I hear, even if it's just a quiet, unassuming yes to attend an event or no to something someone is asking of me, I feel like I've triumphed. Like somehow taking that voice seriously has an impact that reaches all the way back and all the way through to the time I was silenced as a little girl. That if I remember the worth of the quiet, fierce, unassuming voice of love inside of me, I save myself each time I simply use it. I guess it feels collective too. That it's not just a personal battle over my own demons. I win when I listen to that voice and believe it enough to take action on it and to do what's true for me. I also somehow move Mary's story forward. I heal the disbelief. 
I heal the ancient misunderstanding that I was ever unworthy and that you could ever be unworthy and that she was unworthy. In consciously listening for what's true for me and saying it, I practice the fact that I believe Mary. I don't know what's next for me and Mary Magdalene. What I see or imagine is simple. There's this circle of us, this motley crew, and we're all trying to understand her gospel. Maybe we're a church or a congregation of some sort that has included all the bits the Bible left out. And we try imperfectly together to practice and know the kind of radical love her heart was capable of. Can you see it? Maybe we'll sit in the same circle at some point. Or maybe you'll start a circle wherever you are. Realizing as you must by now, that you are as much as an authority on Mary Magdalene as I am, because you're an authority of the voice of your own soul. And because you remember that there is no hierarchy in the spiritual world. Or if the circles aren't for you, or you can't cross the distance to join one, just stay where you are. There's no distance love cannot cross. Just tie a red thread around your wrist and go inward. I'll leave you with this. My lady love, Kate, or the good witch, as Shy has called her since he was two, spent a weekend with me recently at a place called Omega. It was some sort of woman's soul camp slumber party. We came to see some of our favorite writers and her wife for a conference about living our truest self. I was expecting to cry a lot because Kate and I always do. Same. Our proximity to each other seems to amplify all of our emotions. And this, of course, makes our laughter harder, too. What I wasn't expecting were the jolts of sheer electricity that shot through me every time I saw the two presenters look at each other. Their love was visible, palp palpable. My soul swooned. Each time I saw that light in their eyes dip like a tiny flash of lightning between them, my body seemed to erupt with an exuberant gospel choir singing, everything is still possible. We discuss the importance of women coming together, of letting our love for each other shift the current climate of divisiveness, that we can answer this time or alter facts that incite violence with more unity, with an even louder, more radical love, and we can practice love more faithfully. As Dr. Cornell West describes, justice is what love looks like in public. There was a lot of dancing, which to me has always felt like the way women pray when no one else is watching. At one point, Pink's I Am Here came over the speakers and we all shut up like choreographed dancers into the aisles and in between the chairs. I thought as I danced of the picture my mom had taken of me and Tarana Burke, founder of the Me Too moment earlier that week. It was taken right after I sobbed my thank you to her brilliant knowing ears and I said to her, I'm a survivor. I never felt less alone. We're together now. And I thought of all the marches I had joined recently. My one small raspy voice among a sea of other voices unified as if one mouth. I knew I was making my mother and great grandmother proud. And I also knew all the generations who had stood up through the centuries to love the other as themselves. My eyes are so puffy and red in that picture and the smile that's on my face. I've never looked more real. There's elation in it. There's a resilience, this victory, this tiny personal triumph. This is what I felt as I danced with the good witch and about 300 other women. Tears streaming down my face, ecstatic, screaming off key, but with the force of a, de of a declaration, I am here. Here in a body with a sign above the door in my heart that reads, here anyone can live free. We've seen the world that the ego creates in its unstable quest to acquire material worth, power over others, and supremacy. What we have the possibility of cultivating is the world the soul creates. The world Christ and Mary and a radical band of believers in the first century wanted to realize. The ones who knew that the inner transformation creates the outer transformation. That the love that's hidden with each of us is the only power that can save all of us. I thought of Penny and the prayer of the heart that she had taught me on that Buddhist retreat so long ago. 
And I realized that this is what her presence had said to me too, that everything was still possible. Or as the Nobel Peace Prize nominated author and monk relates, because you are alive, everything is possible. I think my elation came from this. There was no part of me that was existing elsewhere. I was here with a radical band of believers. We're all still here. The names and the dates change, but the love never ends. On the last night of the retreat, Kate and I, in matching jammies, rolled up the imaginary window between our beds so we stopped talking and said our good nights early to get some sleep. I pulled up the covers and proceeded to have the least restful night of my life. Here I was at a place called Omega, which is the last letter in the grief alphabet or the end. And here's what it felt like. I closed my eyes and I walked wide awake into a pitch dark classroom. It felt like I was entering kindergarten, no preschool. I was starting all over. I was at the beginning again. My heart started to swell with this light. No, it's not a light, it's a warmth. No, it's more than a feeling of warmth. It's the absence of emptiness. It's a sensation of finally reaching a place you realize in a very real way you have never left. You just know now, you're here. This is where you are in reality. Right here, in the dark, in the presence of the light that has never left you. And as you let your heart swell, all you can see is a hand reaching out towards you. And you don't need to know what's next. When what's next comes from within, you just remain. You just reach out to take this hand that is always extending out towards you. And you start again. You hear Joan of Arc say, I am not afraid. I was born to do this. You hear Marguerite Portier say, love has no beginning and no end, no limit, and I am nothing except love. You hear Perpetua say, love one another. You hear Thecla say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I baptize myself. And you hear Mary Magdalene say, I will teach you about what is hidden from you. And this is how you rise. Further up is farther in. And the darkness is where the light has always been. Here in the heart is the treasure. And you remember again and again. I am here.